can go ahead and get us started. Yep, I'll share my screen. Uh, looks good, Taylor. You're coming through clear. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Welcome to the uh, this week's Crow Canyon webinar. Uh, we've got Dr. Weston McCool here. Um, and before I kick it off to him, we've got some announcements as per usual. Um, one of the things that we want, we always make sure to do is a land acknowledgement. And so the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits. Our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, one of the other things that we just kind of wanted to uh, make everyone aware of is our spring appeal. Um, and so uh, we're, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this October. Um, and, uh, you know, we just want to say that we have, you know, thousands of people every year that have come to campus. And so updates, upgrades and repairs are just kind of part and parcel to what we need and what we need to do to continue our mission. So if you're interested in helping us um, uh, do those upgrades and repairs, um, which includes, you know, uh, upgrades and upgrades to the webinar series, um, you can go to this link right here and, and donate. Um, so if you need more information, you can feel free to contact any one of us on, on the web page about that. Um, I know we're all very versed in Zoom right now. Um, I just want to say a couple, just have a couple of reminders on the kind of um, practical side of this. Be sure to put your questions in the Q&A part, not into the chat. So Q&A, not chat. And if you have any issues whatsoever, we're also streaming this uh, live on Facebook. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, interesting uh, webinars coming up um, next week and the week after that. Um, so. The next one will be More Than Warp and Weft, Weft The Survival of Diné Textile Arts. Um, and then the week after that will be a um, kind of a panel uh, about Crow Canyon uh, internships, uh, the internship program through time. So that'll be uh, really great. So let me introduce Dr. Weston McCool. He's a quantitative archeologist and human ecologist interested in all the ways that humans adapt to challenging circumstances so whether climate shocks, resource poor environments, population pressure or conflicts, humans establish innovative though not always successful strategies for coping with hard times. His role as an archeologist is to use our material, material remains to infer past human behavior within a perspective of human behavioral ecology. So this means that Dr. McCool is interested in the archeological record from what it can tell for what it can tell us about behavior in relation to complex socio-ecological dynamics. He is particularly interested in why people so often resort to violent conflict and its impacts on population health and resilience. He explores these issues using spatio statistical models, big data, isotope chemistry, and other methods from environmental archeology span and bioarcheology. span Weston's primary field sites are in the central Andes and Western North America, but he has experience working with archaeological and contemporary populations around the globe. Um, so I hope you all will or join me in welcoming Dr. Weston McCool. Great. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, everybody, for having me today. Uh, I'm here in Salt Lake City, so not too far away. And I'll just say that I am such a big fan of Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and it is doing such good work, and its mission is so important. So it's an honor to be here today. And thank you for having me. With that, I will go ahead and get started. Can everyone see this? You're coming through clear. OK, great. Thank you, Taylor. So I'm going to talk today about some research I did a few years ago with my colleague, Dr. Peter Jaworski, who's now at Aarhus University in Denmark, way across the pond. And this is exploring Fremont territoriality in Nine Mile Canyon, Utah. And 
with that, I'll get into it. Now, I'm going to start with a very simple sort of skimming along the surface definition of the Fremont complex for those unfamiliar. So the Fremont complex, sometimes called the Fremont farming frontier, was an amalgam of sort of mixed economy, farming, foraging populations, living in boundaries that roughly fit the size of modern Utah. These were distributed along the Western Colorado Plateau, where my research has taken place, and the Eastern Great Basin. And it's often called the farming frontier because the Fremont represent the furthest Northern maize farming that took place in Western North America prior to contact. Typically it is normal with many archeological cultures and the Fremont are no exception to try to understand the Fremont as a cultural phenomenon using shared material culture. So for the Fremont, this often involves stone balls and bone and stone gaming pieces pictured here, deer hawk moccasins, and the famous trapezoidal anthropomorphic rock art pictured, pictured here. The Fremont are also defined by beautiful clay figurines and the predominant use of plain grayware ceramics, but also include painted, beautiful painted black on gray and occasional red variety. And there's also a good helping of corrugated and incised styles. To briefly go over the culture history, generally archaeologists refer to the Fremont period as the formative period. I just like to refer to it as the Fremont period. And this is roughly from about 0 CE to 1400, and it more or less coincides with maize agriculture in Utah. So from about 200 to 500 CE, that's when we see the first ceramics and the beginnings of agriculture. Now, ceramics and agriculture are later as you move to more northern latitudes, like Nine Mile Canyon. It's often defined by sedentary habitation sites with the famous pit houses, but also storage features and some ritual structures as well. There was, especially early on, logistic mobility. People would seasonally be sedentary to farm and seasonally be mobile to supplement farming with hunting, gathering, and fishing. But as time went on, uh, foraging strategies sort of decreased in their importance and intensive maize farming uh, served to constitute a larger and larger portion of the diet. And then we see these Western Colorado Plateau in Utah largely abandoned sometime in the 13 or 1400s and in some areas early and some areas later. So, oops. Basically, it's pretty hard to define what the Fremont complex was, mostly because there's more variability than patterning. There are exceptions to every rule. For example, that cultural patterning I just brought up, that's simply not present at a lot of Fremont sites. So since the 90s, archaeologists have sort of turned away from establishing established categories of material culture to really define what the com Fremont complex were as a whole, and instead turn to trying to explain adaptive diversity. What drove differences in Fremont adaptations through time and across space? And generally we think of the Fremont as less sociopolitically complex, just in terms of sort of hierarchical standing than Southwestern groups. These are a population where local decision-making was really important. Local groups had to make it or break it based on their own labor and knowledge. We generally see a north-south trend in southwestern affinities, where in northern Utah, that's where we see the lowest frequency of traditional sort of four-corner southwest cultural affinities. Now, the Fremont were incredibly resilient. They, for over a thousand years, farmed maize in the desert. It's important to remember maize is a tropical grass. It was domesticated in Mesoamerica and the Colorado Plateau is of course a high elevation desert environment. It's not where maize wants to grow. In addition, Colorado Plateau faces sparse, unpredictable precipitation. For example, it's April 20th and here in Utah, it's snowing right now, which is insane. 
So sparse, unpredictable precipitation, over 240 nights a year, typically with crop killing frost, so a very short growing season. There are few perennial streams. Many of those streams that are perennial are entrenched, which means they don't offer arable land. There's often shallow soil, intense erosion, and the other uh, domesticated crops that are often grown in association with maize, like squash and beans, actually need more water and typically more frost-free days than maize. So even though maize was where quantified on up to 80% of the diet, it is extremely difficult to do, yet the Fremont made it successful for over a thousand years. In the primary strategy or adaptation uh, to, to uh, cope with these difficult circumstances is irrigation farming. So most Fremont population centers are distributed along irrigation corridors and perennial stream systems where they could farm either uh, on areas that are seasonally flooded, that have alluvial fans, that are close to standing water where sub-irrigation can occur, or up above drainages where canals can be dug to deliver water to, to feed agricultural systems. And so we see most Fremont sites in these perennial systems really relying on irrigation. And the reason for this is particularly in northern Utah, say in Nine Mile Canyon, pictured here, if you travel to the point where you're high enough, where there's enough rainfall for dry farming, it's so cold that there's not a sufficiently long grow growing season. If you travel downslope to a location where growing season is sufficiently long, there's not enough precipitation for dry farming. So there's no real Goldilocks zone for dry farming. And instead, people are relying on low elevation locations, lowest they can find within drainages with an irrigation budget. So now that we have sort of the socio-ecological context, let's move on to the topic at hand, territoriality, and start with some simple definitions. Territoriality is most often defined as some combination of the active excluding of competitors from a resource patch by a defense or advertisement. That could be signs, that could be fences, that could be border patrols, that could be active confrontation. We can contrast this from a home range, which is the total area occupied by a group or multiple groups. And there's huge amounts of variation in territoriality among human groups. Some don't practice territory at all. There are multiple groups, populations, tribes, accessing similar or overlapping resource patches in the same place at the same time. There are populations who are seasonally territorial, and there are entire landscapes where we experience uh, stable territorial systems year round. So we're interested in what explains that variation. Now to do, to do that, to essentially identify where and why territoriality occurs, we need to overcome two challenges. The first is that archeological markers of territoriality are often identified by uh, subjective observation. That means that essentially individuals go to those sites, they interpret those sites as having a particular function, and then they write about how those served some sort of defensive interests, such as territoriality. And while that's a really great way of starting and proposing a hypothesis, we really need to test those functional hypotheses before we really make a conclusion whether what we're seeing is a stable territorial system. The other is a lot of studies of territoriality, until recently, lack theory that's able to predict the conditions that favor territorial behavior. After all, that's where we should always start. When should territoriality be favored? And then do we see it? Do we not? So I'm gonna talk about two models. These are models from population ecology and evolutionary ecology that propose what conditions should promote territoriality. The first is a classic called the economic defensibility model. This has a simple qualitative prediction. That is the benefits for territoriality are likely to be highest and the costs lowest when resources are dense and predictable. A simple example to illustrate this it would be very difficult to territorialize a bison herd. They are largely dispersed. They disperse further when you pursue them. They are on the move. Uh, predicting where they're gonna be and when they're gonna be there is very difficult. 
all of which would combine to make it exceedingly costly for a small group of individuals to territorialize to prevent anybody else from hunting bison. And indeed, when bison move in large herds, there are often multiple groups hunting them at once. Now, if we convert those bison into, say, domestic cattle and pin them in a, a single herd in a pen, now we're in a position where the cattle are in a dense cluster, they're in a pen, so their location and their timing is predictable. And now we're in a classic system of pastoralism where defending these herds is extremely important and has high payoffs. Indeed, some of the biggest challenges to pastoralists around the world is how to defend their herds because herd theft is really rampant. We'll combine this with one more model. This is called the marginal utility of resources. Now, marginal utility is a basic mathematical concept from evolutionary theory, from micro and macroeconomics. It cross cuts a lot of different fields, but it, the core idea is quite simple. It is that while the absolute value of a resource might be the same for multiple individuals, resources have different relative values. So another quick example, we imagine two individuals coming by, uh, along a wayward cow that has escaped a pen. One individual has no cattle for his or herself and is starving. The other individual has 999 more cows sitting at home and they want to bring home this wayward individual to round it off to a thousand. Which of those individuals will fight harder to acquire or defend that resource? Certainly the individual to where that resource is scarce. So the absolute value is the same, but the relative value is different. And so are then the payoffs for attempting to acquire or defend that resource. And so the simple axiom here is that people will have higher payoffs for defending or acquiring by force a resource when resources are scarce. And as their resources become more abundant, the payoffs for attempting to forcibly acquire or defend each additional resource will diminish, they will have diminishing returns. So these theories combine to suggest territory should emerge when the benefits outweigh the costs. And those benefits are most likely to be highest when resources are dense, predictable, and scarce. Now these are simple ecological models. The reason being is because it's best to start simple and add complexity in when needed. And so it overlooks something like competitive abilities. We think back to that hypothetical example, the two individuals perhaps fighting over the single wayward cow. The calculus of that exchange changes if that rancher with a thousand cattle had 10 additional individuals with them. So that one starving individual might really be willing to fight for that cow, but simply won't win. So there could be asymmetries in group formidability that even though it's worth it to try to defend, it's too risky to try to do so. Now, the other potential problem with these simple ecological models is they don't really quantify what they mean by dense and predictable. And so we can get systems where we have a local resource that's dense and predictable, say a harvest of maize, but we can get so that the arable land is actually widely distributed across the landscape. So your plot of farmland produces a dense and predictable resource, but the next plot is until two miles away, and the next plot is four miles away. And so while it may be beneficial to look after your plot, actually territorializing that whole arable landscape could be extremely costly because they are dense at the household level, but they are dispersed at the population or group level. So let's go into Nine Mile Canyon. Nine Mile Canyon is a tributary of the Green River. It is a perennial stream coming off of the eastern Tabaputs Plateau in east central Utah. Here is a picture of what Nine Mile Canyon looks like. It's a beautiful uh, Colorado Plateau Canyon. And in it, you can farm these uh, alluvial patches down in the bottom of the canyon. And indeed today, people are still farming this canyon system. And up outside of it, you cannot farm those areas. There is insufficient precipitation for dry farming. And so down in this area, farming is pretty good. Outside of it, it is non-tenable. So let's describe the Nine Mile Canyon resource distribution, the environment. 
Nine Mile Canyon is defined by these well-defined patches of circumscribed arable land. Circumscribed simply means if you're in that patch, it's productive, and everywhere surrounding outside of that patch is non-tenable. So we sort of have cl clustered and predictable arable land. Their economy was maize production, and this is full-time producing a dense and predictable resource, maize harvests that are collected and their surplus stored. And there's additional evidence in Nine Mile Canyon and more broadly in the Western Colorado Plateau that through time, there's the depression of other wild resources making farming more important. There's increasing population pressure, as we'll see in a second. And there is this circumscription that limits alternative options. What this means is through time, we can see increasing competition for available arable land. And if you get kicked off a patch, you just might be in trouble. So these conditions combining with our theoretical models really make a strong prediction for territoriality. But what about scarcity? What we have here is a recent population reconstruction of Fremont in both the Great Basin and in green, the Colorado Plateau, which I will emphasize here. And what you see, is with the advent of farming, there is rapid and sustained population growth that continues until the abandonment of the region when it falls down very, very low. And so what you're seeing is that through time, we're seeing a record of competition. As demography skyrockets, arable land is being subdivided in between a greater and greater number of individuals. We're also seeing potential climate downturns and shocks. What I'll refer to here, this is a population reconstruction for the Fremont. And right as populations are peaking, we see a climate shift from warm, wet conditions down to cold, more arid conditions. And what these conditions mean, that reduced precipitation is going to lead to perhaps problems with the reliability or abundance of runoff and shorter growing seasons. So they're gonna uh, affect both productivity and risk. Combining these, we'd suggest that these socio-ecological conditions promote dense predictable resources in a marginal circumscribed environment. We see that through time, climate shocks and population pressure very much could be created seasonal or even chronic resource uh, potential scarcity. And we should, certainly expect to see a stable territorial system. Now, what would that look like? The most common strategy is to centralize people and harvests into a nucleated village that is either fortified or located on a naturally defensible location. So in these nucleated village, we protect people, we protect harvests through, in this case, in this photo here, of a Mississippian village, I believe, don't quote me on that, uh, with the classic palisade system. Now, there's no evidence that any sort of system like this took place in Nine Mile Canyon. It's pretty hard to capture what a habitation or village site the Fremont looks like in Nine Mile Canyon. This is one, there are pit houses here, but with few exceptions, in Nine Mile Canyon, Fremont pit houses are located in the valley bottoms. So just outside the alluvial terraces where farming is best. They are not densely nucleated. They are scattered throughout the ribbons of arable land and they are not located in defensible locations and there's no evidence of fortifications. Not only that, they tend to lack storage features and indeed, Harvests were stored in these features called remote granaries. They're called remote because the most fun game to play in Nine Mile Canyon is to play find that granary. So harvests, instead of being centrally located and defended, are quite the opposite. They are scattered throughout the canyon complex, often in hidden or inaccessible locations. So they weren't defending population centers, they weren't nucleated, and they weren't centralizing harvests into defensible locations. Another possibility is rather than defending specific plots or storage sites or villages, there is a 
active pattern of maintaining territorial boundaries of the agricultural landscape. So defend Nine Mile Canyon rather than any particular sites. Well, to do that, you need a system, a system to monitor boundaries, to identify intruders, and to confront and exclude those intruders. And indeed, in Nine Mile Canyon, located throughout the canyon, there are these tower structures, two of them pictured here. These have been noted by the earliest explorers through Nine Mile Canyon, and since the 1800s, explorers and archaeologists have proposed that the function of these towers are to act as watchtowers to identify and exclude intruders. So if true, this would actually be some really interesting and straightforward archaeological evidence of a large landscape level territorial system. Now, while many people have argued that, nobody has really gone out and tested that to make sure, well, do these towers, when we look at their distribution, exhibit the functional properties of watchtowers? So we set out to test two different hypotheses. One is the watchtower. If these are watchtowers, they should have the functional properties of watchtowers. They should have large view sheds. These view sheds should overlook major transportation corridors, and they should provide ample warning time to canyon residents. Watchtowers can be fortified or located in naturally defensible locations, so long as these qualities do not inhibit their observational abilities, their primary function. Now, our alternative hypothesis, sort of think about it like the null, is that these are not watchtowers at all, these are refuges. So instead of maximizing view shed and warning times, they want to minimize accessibility. And as such, they might not be located in places where view shed is best or where view shed is good. They might actually be located in hidden locations and they might not be located in areas that are going to yield the largest warning times. So to test that, we took all of the recorded structure, uh, excuse me, tower sites in Lower Nine Mile Canyon and we used a GIS to generate random points. Now, all these tower structures are in sort of similar areas in the canyon, similar slopes, similar elevations, and have similar distances from habitation sites. So it's important when we generated this random point sample that we generated it within what we'll call the same tower belt, because we want them to have be in the same general location as the site. And what these random points do is they essentially establish background values of what within this tower belt, the average view shed looks like or warning time or def natural defensibility. So we set to ask these specific questions. Are towers located in areas that maximize view sheds? Are they located in areas that maximize warning times to canyon residents? And are they constructed in naturally defensible locations? So we use GIS and spatial statistics. And the first thing we did was we compared the size of the tower view sheds to the size of view sheds generated for each random point. So we can compare the size of the view sheds from the towers to the average background values. We also estimated warning times based on Tobler's hiking functions. So this was a little more complex. So I'll show a figure here to illustrate what we did. This is just a little snapshot of Nine Mile Canyon. We created an agent, what we called the intruder. This intruder used a least cost path determined by GIS to come into the canyon and access a habitation or residential site, seen here as a square. We then generated a view shed for the towers and travel contours. If somebody's walking four kilometers an hour, this is how long it takes them to travel. So we asked for this intruder, when do they enter the view shed? Once they've entered the view shed, how much time until they arrive at the habitation site? That's the warning time. We also asked how much time do they spend in the view shed? to test not only if they have large view sheds, but they're located to maximize the amount of time they could see people traveling down transportation corridors. We did the exact same analysis for all of the random points. So each random point also has a warning time and it also has total amount of time spent traveling in a view shed. So we did some KS statistical tests 
The first one we did was the overall view shed size. And what we see is the view shed size of the towers and the random points are statistically similar, which means the view sheds of these sites are no better than if you distributed them randomly throughout the tower belt. So they're no better than average background values, their overall size. Here we have the warning times. We have different plots for intruders coming from different directions. And here we have total amount of time spent in view shed. Again, with all four statistical tests, the random points and the towers have statistically similar results. This means the tower sites are not better at warning canyon residents than the random points. In other words, warning times are no better than average background values. And I believe the average warning time was 12 minutes. Now, the hiking function we used was four kilometers an hour. That's a walking speed. In reality, there would vary between people and most intruders would be moving faster than that. But it doesn't really matter how fast we have this intruder go because we're mostly interested in the relative time between the random points and the towers. Now, if the intruders weren't walking and we're on a fast clip, that 12 minutes is optimistic. And quite frankly, if it were me, 12 minutes or less is not enough time. Now, down here, we have the same thing. So the total time spent in the view sheds is no different between the towers and the random points. So what that means is that they're not placed in areas where they have the maximum amount of time to observe transportation corridors. So things aren't looking good for the watchtower hypothesis. Now, what about the refuge hypothesis? To do this, we use GIS again. We generated two buffers, 100 meter buffer and a 10 meter buffer around the towers and the random points. This is to measure the accessibility using slope, leading in the landform, the 100 meters, sort of the landform leading up to the towers and the random points, and the immediate approach, 10 meters, up to the towers and the random points. And again, used a KS test to compare distributions. Here we have statistically significant results. What these results are telling us is that the tower sites are placed in locations that are significantly more defensible, think about that, or less accessible than the random points, which means as you travel through Nine Mile Canyon, the most defensible locations, both on the landform and the immediate approach, are where the towers are located. So they are located in places that maximize defensibility, but they're not in places that maximize the functional properties of a watchtower. So we didn't find evidence for this watchtower hypothesis, and instead, found support for the alternative that these functioned as refuges. So to sum up, these Nine Mile Canyon Fremont avoided the exclusionary confrontations needed to maintain territorial boundaries and instead practiced passive defense of harvested resources. Now this is interesting. This is exactly the socio-ecological conditions that theory tells us we'd expect to see a strong systemic exclusionary territoriality type of strategy. And that's not what we're seeing. So what's going on? We think it really has to do with two different elements that we talked about before that aren't quite in the ecological models. They still fit the general theory, but these require adding complexity to these simple ecological models, having to do with competitive ability and landscape resource distributions. So we see in Nine Mile Canyon, it would be very, very costly for all the residents of Lower Nine Mile Canyon to aggregate into a defended nucleated settlement. That's because the arable patches are in a thin ribbon that is long and narrow. So people would have to pay huge travel and transportation costs to go out to these farming fields. So the people were dispersed just like the arable land. And there is evidence throughout the occupational sequence that while perhaps foraging declined, it did continue so that there were seasons where a part of this population was out foraging or perhaps hunting for artiodactyls or other big game, such that a proportion of the population was gone during critical times. Now, what we do know 
is that village sizes outside of Nine Mile Canyon, along the Green River and parts of the Uinta and in parts of the San Rafael Swell, the surrounding areas, are much larger than those in Nine Mile Canyon. So this might have something to do with competitive abilities. So if raiding groups, groups coming in from other areas, were able to aggregate a large coalition of raiders, it would simply be too risky for Fremont farmers to actively try to include them because they simply wouldn't have the formidability to do this. It would be prohibitively dangerous. So within this constraint, the Nine Mile Canyon Fremont adopted some pretty genius strategies. One is to place harvested resources in scattered, hidden, difficult to access locations to reduce the risk of theft or raiding and avoid if possible catastrophic loss. The other is cons to construct refuge sites to lower the risk of interpersonal violence by larger neighboring groups. And we can think of these both as adaptations to cope with potential resource theft and perhaps later interpersonal or intergroup violent conflict. Now, these small type of subsistence groups don't practice expansionist warfare, really forceful land procurement. So it's likely that as long as they were able to avoid these raids to protect themselves and scatter their resources, that they could persist under this adaptation for some time. Nonetheless, it is costly to construct these tower sites. It's costly to construct remote storage granaries. And if some of their harvests are being forcibly removed or taken, this might have contributed to the regional abandonment in the 15th century. And that's the question we're pursuing with current research. On a broader sort of anthropological front, we'd see that this is an example of socio-ecological conditions disfavoring territoriality, despite dense and predictable resources. And this is probably due, as we said before, uh, to costs of territorial boundary maintenance and the risk of harm from larger, more formidable groups. So why this might be useful, uh, agricultural societies, societies that define the globe today and have in many areas for as much as 10,000 years, are in the business full time of making dense and predictable resources. Nonetheless, there is variation in how much people invest in territoriality or whether populations are territorial. And so we think that this side of these kinds of constraints might help us explain between group variation in territorial investment in agricultural societies. And this might yield insights into long-term community resilience with populations that are able to successfully territorialize, perhaps better able to cope with things like climate shocks than those that are not. So I'll just switch gears here quickly and talk about our current project. So I'm working here at the University of Utah with Dr. Brian Cotting on an NSF project. Rather than sort of deducing some of the functional aspects of uh, maize farming sites, we are instead using the property of maize farming sites to try to understand some of the drivers of conflict in the past. So we're going to evaluate the effects of climate change and uncertainty, demographic pressure, and inequality on violent conflict in the pre-contact North American Southwest. This project is currently ongoing right now. We're working in the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, so the northern periphery of ancestral Puebloan farmers, and using habitation site defensibility as a proxy for conflict. So seeing how climate, population inequality, and uncertainty interact to affect the rise and fall of conflict. With that, I'll say thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for having me today. Uh, and I'll just direct you to our paper if you're interested in some more detail, published in 2019 in Quaternary International. And I'm happy to uh, field any questions. All right, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Weston. This is great. So we've got a, a few questions in here, so I'll get us started. One of the things that popped up um, during the, when you were going over your, the slide that had uh, territoriality as the header on it, um, was the kind of, uh, you had uh, the interaction, you were explaining the interaction between how resources can be dense and scarce um, and we were kind of just wondering if um, 
you were talking that things can be dense and scarce at the same time, or um, just kind of if you could clarify that. Right. Yeah. Good point. So let's imagine a heterogeneous landscape. Uh, I'll open this up. A heterogeneous landscape like Utah. What we often see is that when there's a climate shock, say there's one year where there's 30% less precipitation than the previous 10 years on average, that's a shock because we couldn't expect it. And it's bad. It's unfavorable climate change. Because the landscape is so heterogeneous, that shock won't be felt equally across the landscape. There could be areas where it leads to increased productivity. There could be microclimates where it doesn't affect growth whatsoever. There could be areas where it's catastrophic. So you can get a system where one valley is producing a dense and predictable resource or largely unaffected by this climate shock. In the next valley, their crop fails and they're experiencing a shortfall. So now you have a dense and predictable resource in some areas of space and pronounced scarcity in other areas of space. And this is where we see a lot of really intensive violent conflict when there are intense have and have nots. Essentially, this is environmentally driven inequality, resource inequality. And so this is where those individuals might be very interested in moving into that more productive valley or raiding or, you know, and there's, I should say here, this is just sort of one aspect of behavior. Of course, exchange, uh, cooperation are going to be adaptive responses as well. So where we see things really difficult in the Fremont land is when there are what we call correlated shocks. These are correlated shocks where they tend to lead to negative outcomes across the board. There's still variation in how negative they are, but everybody's experiencing shortfalls. So maize is always gonna be dense and predictable, right? You have a storage unit chock full of it, but its skill could be an extreme rarity on the landscape to where individuals should be willing to risk life and limb to defend or acquire it. Your, your your email address is being tossed around the chat right now. Um, people are you're going to get emails apparently after this. People got lots of questions. Thank cool. you for explaining that. We actually have two questions um, by Lynn Sebastian and Jay Cater uh, about um, populations at the time, and I'll just use uh, Lynn's question for in both of these. I think they're touching on the same thing. So, how many people could have been accommodated in the known tower sites? And how does this compare with the estimated population of the residential sites in the canyon? Yeah, that's a really great question. The answer is we don't know. <laughs> we, we would love to do that type of research. So we are just now sort of getting around to estimating population changes in Nine Mile Canyon throughout the formative period. So this is a paper being led by Peter Uwarski, myself, and several other individuals it's also being published in Quaternary International and will be out uh, next year. And so we do see uh, roughly a spike in population coincident with what limited chronological chronometric data we have with tower construction. Uh, in terms of relative sizes, that'd be a great study. That'd be a great study. Uh, the hard part about that would be it would require quite a bit of intensive excavation, simply for the fact that in Nine Mile Canyon, Fremont villages are sort of famous for amalgam occupations where there could be 10 houses, but at any one time, only three or four of them are occupied. It'd be a great project. Like, yeah, <laughs> another question here um, is uh, how, you know, how can you think about incorporating like the risk of rating events um, into, into these kinds of models. Yeah, so it, the risk of the rating event in terms of how you react to it or the risk of going on a rating event, I'm gonna assume it's the former. Uh, yeah, the yeah. Of, yeah, reacting, reacting to right. it. Right, so I, I think those refuges are essentially uh, an archeological manifestation of attempting yeah. to avoid the risk. And um, I hear, uh, members of Crow Canyon will be in Nine Mile Canyon, perhaps later in the year, and um, take a look at those tower sites and take a look at some of the remote storage features. 
And not only is it nuts, I mean, it's, it's the, the engineering know-how to construct some of these tower sites and especially the remote storage uh, uh, facilities is incredible. But getting up every day and going and accessing some maze to perhaps put into a stew to eat over the next couple of days is risking life and limb. So you don't really do that unless you have to make extremely risky and costly constructions like that, unless things are dangerous. So I think this, what's called the remote granary practice and this refuge practice are the dual manifestations of how to deal with the risk of raids and likely the risk of raids from groups that are, are simply more formidable than, than those local residents. You, you know, I have uh, questions about those, the, the granaries, um, you know, can you see doing it or has there already been a similar analysis of those granaries or granary construction through time that you could see linking up with this, what you've done here? Yeah, so we've actually done an analysis on uh, the granaries similar to the towers, and that's how we can make this statement that they are inaccessible and hidden. And so we did a similar analysis. And if you ever get uh, run across archaeologist Pete Jaworski, tell him to get back on publishing that storage paper. But we did do that formal analysis. And so those granaries are placed in locations that are more hidden and inaccessible than the background values. And Pete Jaworski, for his dissertation that's now available through ProQuest, went out and actually dated about 25 of those granaries. And they do appear to be less accessible through time. Wow. Oh, that's so that's so interesting. That's like exactly the question I had. Um, can you see doing that with towers in the future? Yeah, like the yeah, we, we'd love to do that. The the difficulty there and there is some existing dates for towers. We'd like to get additional dates. Some of them are old. They're still important, but tend to have large errors. Sure. We'd love to do that. These tower sites are very, very popular among pot hunters, among tourists, among everybody. So they are absolutely picked clean and they most of them don't have mud mortar. So with, that's how we date the granaries. We just take tiny little scrapings of the mud mortar until we get some macro botanical remains. And then we can date that to get the construction date. Uh, the same is not true for most of the towers. And so we're sort of still thinking through perhaps some alternative ways, maybe optical thermal luminescence, but it's going to be a challenge to get to get concrete dates on a lot of those towers. And so we're sort of instead taking a broader landscape approach and saying, well, when is it on the broader sort of northern Colorado plateau that these types of hyper defensive constructions take place? So if we can't get the chronological distribution locally, we could fit it into the broader landscape pattern. Awesome. Um, one of the questions, one, another really interesting question here uh, brings up kind of wild resources and, and their predictability. And this uh, links up with a question that I had too, um, which is, you know, with these models, can you see wild resources kind of throwing anything off? And I specifically have interest in aquatic resources and those are, you know, usually nicely predictable. What, what's that like in the canyon? Yeah, so... Great question, right? That's always that's always the the key question among the Fremont is what's going on with the mixed economy. So we have some data points on the broader landscape that are showing pretty clear resource transition uh, depression. Excuse me, resource right. depression. At the same time, we're seeing agricultural intensification ramp up. Now, in terms of aquatic resources, uh, Nine Mile Canyon is a very very small creek. And that's actually pretty characteristic of a lot of uh, Fremont farming. I think the reason why I'm speculating here, I want to test this. I think the reason why is because larger tributaries like the Green, which could have been transportation corridors, there's catfish, there's uh, more aquatic resources. They're mostly entrenched. The walls come right down to the water. And before they were dammed, they were getting really significant differences in flow. So you could end up as a scenario with you plant in May and by July, your crops are high and dry, 
where you plant low and the May uh, precipitation comes or even some summer monsoon rains come and they get flooded out, whereas these smaller perennial streams are more controlled. But they don't have really abundant aquatic resources in these smaller streams. But in terms of wild resources, there's not really an abundance of high ranking plant resources in the area that are going to be outside of that transportation corridor. And so in that sense, wild plant habitat is competing with maize habitat. And some basically experimental studies have shown that you're going to deplete those wild resources pretty quickly, whereas maize you can intensify and increase your yields. So I think probably through time what's happening is that mixed economy of favorably or if even intentionally cultivating and using wild plant resources is going to decline as more and more land is cleared for maize agriculture. I still think there's these fallback resources. I still think foraging and plant resources are important. But at the end of the day, if the maize harvest fails, you're not getting enough calories from the broader landscape to survive long term. Mm -hmm. So maize isn't everything, but it is the staple. Yeah, it's the big, the big thing. Um, you know, we have some kind of broader questions here. Uh, one of them is, can you just talk a little bit about is, you know, is there a lot of interaction between the Fremont and the and ancestral Pueblo folks? Good question. Um, that's, that's a really, really difficult question. It's a really difficult question because it's still not really clear what the nature of the difference is between the Fremont and ancestral Pueblo. And, and that really depends on who you ask. So there is a bevy of archaeologists who consider the Fremont to be hunter-gatherers who in situ adopted maize farming when maize farming diffused from ancestral Puebloan groups. And then therefore it is an in situ adoption of maize and that sort of continuation of in situ preformative cultural momentum, if you will, sort of creates this difference. There's another alternative, and I think this alternative hypothesis is a little bit better supported by the dietary and demographic data. And this is that Fremont farmers are ancestral Puebloan farmers, that ancestral Puebloan farmers just kept on moving. They crossed the Colorado River. They moved into this upper um, Colorado plateau areas. And because they became further and further away, cultural, cultural traditions, adaptations, material culture started to diverge. And this divergence is sort of a snapshot in time. And we're taking that snapshot and saying, look, these are two different characters. They must be different cultural groups. Um, but there are really interesting interactions. I think the most fascinating interactions are on the Kaiparowitz Plateau on 50 Mile Mountain in Grand Staircase Escalante. You see Fremont pit houses, the gray ware, everything characteristically Fremont from about 400 to 1050 AD. Then from about 1050 AD onwards, everything looks classic Cayenta ancestral Pueblo. Was this one population displacing another? Is this what extensive to intensive maize agriculture looks like, along with increased trade? We don't know. There's a lot of interesting questions there. I'd say in Nine Mile Canyon, you're getting to the point where you're, you know, several hundred miles of really rough terrain from ancestral Pueblo and heartland. And so certainly there's sort of down the line trading going on, but direct interaction, I'm skeptical. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Um, my question here, um, this is, uh, a question that I also had too is, is it possible that towers are not defensive structures, but examples of ritual construction? And one of the things that I think about, I think it's a, I, I'm just yanking this off the top of my head, so I could be very wrong. I think it's a paper by Hobson in Antiquity that talks about Kiva Tower complexes around Chaco Canyon. And that, you know, they when, once you go up them, they don't increase view shed um, or your, you know, visibility, but they're actually, the towers are to be looked upon as almost like beacons on the landscape. So I'm just wondering if you kind of thought about that and how you kind of think about those kinds of questions. Sure, yeah. Um, well, like anything else, I think uh, 
there's a question between sort of primary function, secondary function, tertiary function, and the easiest thing to test is primary function. And so I don't think we need to necessarily create a dichotomy between a ritual site and a defensive site. We can, of course, have sites where the primary function is ritual, nonetheless put in defensive locations to protect it. We can have sites where the primary function is defense, but nonetheless, there can be ritualistic activities conducted at that site. But if this had a pure ritual function, and that was truly the primary, the, the primary function of these sites, and perhaps they were meant to be seen, they're not in good locations for that to happen. The view sheds are statistically the same as random, and they are in the very best spots if they were to be refuges. And so we think, what is the most parsimonious answer? That they're exactly in the places where we expect refuge sites to be. Whereas if that type of defensibility wasn't the primary function, it'd sure be a big coincidence. And because we're not just sort of eyeballing this and seeing that, we can see this come out of the, the statistical results. And so I, I definitely wouldn't come to any assumption to say that these towers don't potentially have a ritualistic or spiritual function or they're not sacred sites. I'd say that they're primarily put there because they offer these defensive qualities. But of course, all sorts of other meanings can be sort of attached to that, connected. Have, have any descendant community members commented on this work um, at all? So Jerry Spangler is uh, the director of the CPAA, the Colorado Plateau Archaeological Alliance. So he was the one that recorded a lot of these sites out in the early 90s. And he has had lots of contact with descendant communities when he was initially doing the work and subsequently and talked to a lot of descendant communities in the area and subsequently I think most broadly about sort of tower sites in general throughout the Southwest. And it is interesting because it's, it's I think like anywhere, it's a point of discussion. Uh, not everybody agrees. Not everybody has the same ideas. Um, it, it really varies on who you ask. I think there is the idea that these were important sacred sites. And, you know, I think absolutely that is something that, um, these descendant communities really know in these towers that makes so much sense to me that I think there's uh this idea that they serve a defensive function is sort of like down to the to the who you ask and so we kind of had we were really interested in the granaries that's sort of the thing we wanted to do and it's like well yeah but what's to do with these towers that's a really important component let's ask around we, we sort of ask everybody who could possibly have an idea for it. And it was like, well, you know, 40% say this, 40% say that, 10% says this, 10%. And so we thought, you know what, we're going to have to just do this the most time consuming way, do the GIS, do the statistics. And ultimately, you know, we consider these results as a hypothesis. There's support for now, but as someone gets better data, as someone gets a broader landscape view, and they fit these 12 towers into 1200, it might end up that uh, there's a bigger pattern that we're missing here. But for the time being, we think that there's really strong evidence that these are indicating that they're refuges. And what dates do exist on these tower sites tend to be later in time, around the same time that these sort of stressful times are coming about. Right. Right. Uh, and on this kind of same, this is a really great question here is like, is there, is there any evidence in the towers for like cooking or hearths or anything like that? Um, They're pretty much clean. Um, yeah. The problem with that, most of them, as they are built on the most defensible location, most of them are built on raw sandstone. So if there were uh, any domestic artifacts in there, they're, they're long gone, long gone. Um, it might have been gone from the earliest expeditions, we don't know. But uh, most of those that are just on the raw sandstone there, they, they could have been well equipped. We just, we just don't know. And we just don't know the nature of what raiding was like. I'm, if it was people coming in, spending a few hours uh, going for the granaries, getting what they can, uh, right? There's no real beast of burden, even if it's a large raiding community, they're only going to be able to carry so much and they leave. So people are up there for a couple of hours, a couple of days, but perhaps not like an entire season. 
Um, okay, I'm going to make this one the last one, Weston. Um, and it's another one that I'm interested in too. Um, and so have there been going back to the kind of these larger connections with different cultural groups around the Fremont, are there any genetic studies done on maize? Good question. Um, yes, <laughs> but none that I'm aware of that if they incorporate maize from sort of this general cultural region, I'm not aware of it. Uh, there have been quite a few studies that date maize and use the dating of maize as sort of a marker of intensification. Uh, Brian Cotting and others have done that. We have a great student here, Ishmael Medina, that's about to publish an article on that. Um, yeah, it would be it would be really useful. Where we do have genetic data on maize, uh, especially in the lower southwest, it's really fascinating because we can see significant and fast artificial selection for um, drought tolerant varieties. And so they are quickly moving away from this uh, tropical grass. Yeah. Um, well, that, we're I'll make have that to one. check back in. I haven't looked at that issue in a few years, so I'll have yeah. to check back in. So uh, it is an interesting okay. question. Yeah. Um, well, we're we're going to make that one the last one. We want to be respectful of your time, and we're just so thankful. Uh, everyone's been asking how they can get in touch with you, so I, I'm going to apologize on behalf of Pro Canyon for your inbox later. But if anyone has any questions about how to get in touch, we put Weston's email in the chat. But you can also just Google, you know, Weston McCool, University of Utah, um, and you can talk with them. So Absolutely. thank yeah. you so much for your time. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. This was a great talk. Oh, thank you so much and keep up the amazing work, Crow Canyon. And thanks everybody for your attention. What amazing questions. It's so exciting to get people interested in your research. So thanks. All right. Bye everyone.